numbers don't always add up. Here's two interesting choices and the non-numerical stuff that leads to them. One thing that I've noticed is that we, this group, the numerically inclined, the mathematically minded, we carry equations in our head, models that we think define us, that we use for making decisions and choices. Let me ask you this, can a set of equations define you and me? Maybe. Can they do a good enough job? I'm not so sure. I think the choices we make do a far better job of defining us, also our dreams and our regrets. Take my dreams for instance. I, I wanted to run the New York Marathon, do a play on Broadway and write a book. Hey, if they were achievable goals or doable, they wouldn't be worthy of mention in this talk. And in case, just in case, you get the wrong idea, I'm not a one-dimensional person. I also like numbers, which is the reason why I opted for the actual profession. I also wanted to do a PhD in finance, get to the final heat of a track event at the Olympics, and own a private island, preferably idly with a five-star resort on it. And let me tell you, I tried, but it wasn't meant to be. Some dreams work, some don't, some end up being a destiny, some do not. I didn't get my PhD, and I didn't make it to my city's track team, let alone to the Olympics. And that is lesson number one. Every dream has a price. Some prices we can afford, some we can't. If you're willing to pay it, you can have a shot at trying. No guarantees, but you can try. But it takes much more than wanting and working for a dream to find its meaning. So how do we pick between dreams? We use models, which brings us to lesson number two the models that we use to make choices. Here's an overly simplified view of what I've learned. The big money in building models is not in building models. It's in intuition. It's in being wrong. It's knowing when these models will break. Not if, but when these models will break. How do you get to set intuition? You get to set intuition by being wrong. Let me explain. Are models often wrong? Of course, they are. But that doesn't reduce their usefulness. I'm old enough to remember the headlines the day after Black Monday in 1987. Do you remember what went wrong? Delta hedging models on synthetic portfolio puts. More examples? Long-term capital management, 11 years later. Long-term capital management, or LTCM for short, meltdown, in 1998 gave me finally the chance to work at Goldman Sachs and I will always be forever grateful to LTCM for that opportunity. What went wrong? Models again. This time a deviation from established processes and their risk engines. Three years later, the dot-com bust in 2001 did me two favors. It cleaned me out twice. First, it killed my startup and left me unemployed and unemployable and then to add insult to injury, it wiped me out as a trader. This time though, there were no actual models involved, just a financial one. We turned down a $2 million term sheet a year earlier because the $7 million valuation for a few sheets of paper was too low. Swad, what were you thinking? There's more, but you should be able to see a trend. The only way to build intuition is to be wrong, is to make mistakes, is to put capital on the line and learn from it. In distance running, the only way to find your true pace is to run. Same rules apply here. Make mistakes. Be wrong. Blow up. Leave hole in the ground. Learn. The kind, when looking back, make you ask, Chavad, what were you thinking? So go ahead, get, start practicing now. Be wrong or be stupid or be both. Before you do, a quick qualification. Listen, we are not talking about outright stupidity. Just in case, like, you know, finding the tallest building in your town, taking the elevator to the roof and then jumping from the roof and taking the short way down. No, 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 no. Trying to learn to fly on the fly on your way down is a really bad idea. Trust me, I'm a founder. I've tried it multiple times. It doesn't work. Not um, recommended. Ex-founders, people who sort of tried it and then numped it, given it up. Ex-founders. All right, great want to be founders at some point in time. Okay, perfect. 
Also, that's not being stupid. That's being suicidal. We are talking about a different kind of stupidity here. You know, the kind that every now and then make you know the voice in your head and says, not that way, this way, not this one, that one. Risks that are big Jamaad, enough for you to ask. What were you thinking? Jamaad, what were you thinking? The tricky part is not the bet. The tricky part is getting fairly compensated for these bets. How? One, control the downside. You can't control the bad breaks, but you do control the circuit breakers. Design them well. Use them well. Two, only take bets that you deeply care about. Sit everything else out. Empathy and anger are the two faces of the same coin. Either care about customers, care about problems, care about people that are around you, or get angry about why things can't get fixed. But to do that, you need to know what you care about. If you don't know the answer to this question, go find that out first before you start placing the big bets. I've been interviewing candidates as an employer as well as for Columbia Business School for 20 plus years. And there's one thing I notice as soon as I walk into the room. It's like an aura. Attitude. It shows. Like all auras, it could be good or bad. You think you're God's gift to mankind? It shows. I can see it all the way from here. Sense of entitlement, yep, also comes across very, very strongly, I can tell. Done stuff that others haven't? You think there is value outside of groupthink? You stand apart from the crowd? You've taken risks that others haven't? All of that shows. And to me personally, I think that's my favorite part. That's my favorite aura, the aura of trying. What is trying? Trying is taking the shot. Trying is taking the bet. Trying is doing what you need to do, that you have to do, knowing very well in advance that you're most likely to fail and then failing. And yet, every single time you go around the circuit, you improve by a small, teeny weeny itsy bitsy little fraction amount trying the art of marginal improvement teaching writing running powerlifting i was hopeless at all of them when i started and then one day, I was not. How? Marginal improvement. Gains don't just compound in sports and training. They also compound in real life. There are two simple rules you have to remember about marginal improvement. One, hard work trumps all other shades. There are no shortcuts. If you really want it and are willing to work for it, you can get close. How close you get depends on how bad you want it, how hard and how long you work your luck and your talent so that's one that's rule number one rule number two what gets measured improves know which metrics and measures to focus on we maintain logs as runners and power lifters to track limits our metric is mileage volume and pace we track limits so that we can push beyond them if you don't know or document your limits you will never know when to push and when to quit i skipped the phd because I didn't want it badly enough. Same is true for the island. Knowing if you really want it, knowing if you want it bad enough, is a good start. Start with that. My specialization in fellowship is in investment and risk, which is the reason why I get a lot of questions on wealth. And this one took a while to learn, simply because, possibly because, they didn't teach this at Columbia Business School. What is wealth? Wealth is not money in the bank. Wealth is flexibility, control, and choice. Wealth is having what money can't buy. Peace, satisfaction, time, love, health, family. If you have one or more of the above, you're wealthy. If you can fall asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow, you're wealthy. If you can run a sub-230 half marathon or a sub-40 10K, you're wealthy. Wealth is not money in the bank. Let me put it in a different way. Where would you rather be? Would you rather be here, stuck in a traffic jam? 
or here running in the rain while the rest of the city is stuck in a traffic jam. Or even better, waking up to this view. If you have the flexibility to choose, if you're not married to your desk or to your job, you are wealthy. Little things are the things we take for granted. We take them for granted all the way to the day they're no longer there. Family, friends, feelings, food, sometimes food. When chips are down, when you've been wiped out, when you prefer the dark over light, who's going to hold your hand and nurse you back to life? When you break, who's going to put you together again? Family, sometimes friends. Don't ignore them, don't discount them, don't take them for granted. Treat every day with them as your last day. Our last year together has been a stark reminder how fragile and precious these bonds are. Take out time for them. Celebrate them wherever, whenever you can. This is simple. Find out what makes you happy and then stay happy. In decision-making models you build, personal decision-making models you build, give this one factor the heaviest of weights. Pick things, do things, make decisions that make you happy. Sound trivial? It isn't. What makes you happy? How do you find an answer to that question? Experiment, explore. On my list, sunrise, numbers, family, mentoring, teaching. Some were clear from the very beginning, others took time to discover. What makes me unhappy? Toxic relationships, difficult, unappreciative customers. I'll go to the end of the world to avoid them. If you can, get rid of them. Now, why does this matter? As a successful professional, you're likely to earn an order of magnitude more in the final two decades of your professional life compared to the first two. But there's an important qualification, a requirement, a condition. You must survive into the final two decades as a healthy, functional professional. Your biggest enemy, your biggest roadblock towards that goal is stress. Stress kills. Stress adds baggage. Stress maims us for life. Unhappiness leads to stress. Being happy releases it. Pick one. Need a recommendation? Choose happiness. Let go of stress. So for our last lesson, we are now back to an equation and that's what we're going to end on. But this is an equation of a different kind. Give more than you receive. Leave things better than you find them. You don't have to win every hand. You can leave some money on the table. Don't complicate this rule like I did. In the beginning, I thought I needed to put aside tens of millions of dollars before I could help change, save or impact a million lives. Why tens of millions of dollars? Because that's all that would be left after I'd bought the island. Let me stop you right there. You don't need the island. You don't need the million dollars. You don't need to save a million lives. You can start with one. Yep, just one. Change one life. Make a difference for one soul. Rinse and repeat. You'd be surprised how quickly they add up. In the language we speak at my home, Urdu, there is a word, Tabir. Tabir means or describes the manifestation, the realization, the meaning of dreams. Tabir. Sometimes the best manifestation of your dreams, the Tabir, is helping others realize their dreams. And those are the seven lessons. We are done. But there's a little last bit left that I want to do before we finish and wrap it up for a day. We started this session with choices we make and my dreams. Did I get to realize any of them at all? Well, you already know about the island, the PhD. I don't have an island. I didn't get the PhD. Well, let's take a look at the rest of my scorecard. The New York Marathon? Nope. I did not get to run the New York Marathon. In fact, I quit running at 19. 25 years later, an incident landed me in a wheelchair for three months. I made a few long haul trips for work that year confined to a wheelchair. I called it flying in the four wheel drive service mode. If you want to change your perspective on life, fly with the wheelchair. In 2015, both doctors and rationality said I would never run again. But I discovered running was the only thing that made me feel I wasn't in a wheelchair. That I was free of my crutches, that those three months were just a bad dream. I ran my first half marathon in Karachi in February 2019, 30 years to the month after I quit running. I ran my third half marathon next year, same month. I even tried a fourth post-COVID this year in February, but did not finish. It was in New York, 
it wasn't a full marathon we were less than 100 runners i'm ashamed to share my finishing time with you in fact i won't but it was good enough it was good enough for someone who started off in a wheelchair that hole in my heart was finally filled and fixed the book i didn't write a book sorry i wrote five <laughs> I wrote five. Some did well, some did not. But I only cared about the writing bit. I wanted to write a book, I wrote it. And then I repeated the adventure five times. Be clear about what you really want from your dreams. I did come very close to doing a play on Broadway, much more closer than the half marathon. Play, cast, reading, rehearsals, all done while I was a student at Columbia. The university had a full service theater on Broadway that we could use for a stage performance. I passed it every day for 18 months. So, so close that I could touch it. But it wasn't meant to be. It was okay. 16 years later, inspired by the struggles of a young sprinter, I told his story through a documentary shot, Dalmia Dreaming. Two years of shooting footage, a year of editing, net 11 minutes of screen time, 25,000 views to date, shot, edited, produced by a one-man team on a shoestring budget in 12. Mohit improved his 100-meter time by 1.42 seconds in the last 14 months. If he can shave another second off, he'll make it to the qualifying heats of the Asian Games. Given his talent and his commitment, there is no doubt that he can do so. Question is, what can we do to help him? It wasn't a play. It wasn't Broadway. It wasn't New York. But just like the half marathon, it was enough. Which brings us to a bonus lesson, lesson number eight. Sometimes good enough is enough. Sometimes the realization, the meaning, the manifestation the tabir of our dreams isn't exactly what we expected it to be. Sometimes it isn't even our dream. We didn't win an Oscar or a BAFTA, but the documentary helped us raise $30,000 for our sprinter and get him to win the Junior National Athletic Championship three years in a row. It helped him pick medals up at the South Asian Federation Games. And most importantly, got him a wild card entry into the Asian Junior Athletic Championship in Tokyo. I never made it to Tokyo, but he did. Sometimes you can afford to pay the price. Sometimes you find your tabir in the dreams of others. It inspired kids to do what I couldn't do as a 16 year old. And it got me out of the wheelchair. Don't give up on your dreams. If you can't afford to pay the price, don't worry, they will wait. And that's the question I'm going to leave you with today. Which of your dreams have you already let go? Which ones are you willing to pay the price for? Which ones have you already given up on? Before you answer that question, remember, rationality, rationality is overrated. Just once. Just once in your life, throw these models and equations out of the window. Step up to the wild side. Live a little. Leave some money on the table. Listen to that little voice in your heart. Not this way. That way. Not this one. That one. Give destiny a spin. You'll be surprised at what she serves up.
Guten Morgen. How do you say hello in Russian? 